Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with more than 3 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we discuss the truth about championship performance. Nobody becomes a champion by accident. We uncover the counterintuitive reality that being a champion isn't about doing more, it's often about doing less. We expose the reality that most people spend too much time planning and not enough time acting and share the specific habits and routines that you can use to model your behavior after champions with our guest, Dana Cavalea. I'm going to tell you why you've been missing out on some incredibly cool stuff if you haven't signed up for our email list yet. All you have to do to sign up is to go to successpodcast.com and sign up right on the homepage. On top of tons of subscriber-only content, exclusive access, and live Q&As with previous guests, monthly giveaways, and much more, I also created an epic free video course just for you. It's called How to Create Time for What Matters Most Even When You're Really Busy. Email subscribers have been raving about this guide. You can get all of that and much more by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage or by texting the word SMARTER to the number 44222 on your phone. If you like what I do on Science of Success, my email list is the number one way to engage with me and go deeper on what I discuss on the show, including free guides, actionable takeaways, exclusive content, and much, much more. Sign up for my email list today by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage. Or if you're on the go, if you're on your phone right now, it's even easier. Just text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. I can't wait to show you all the exciting things you'll get when you sign up and join the email list. In our previous episode, we discussed how you're wrong about what you think will make you happy. Research shows that the vast majority of people are terrible at predicting what will actually make them happy. And even when you think you know what will make you happy, you're often wrong. We break apart the core delusions that stop you from being happy. And we dug into the scientific analysis of the state of enlightenment to uncover that it's not just something for Buddhist monks, but a remarkable brain state that can be achieved by anyone, anywhere, with our previous guests, Dr. Ash Eldafrawi and Dr. Alex Lickerman. If you want to find out what actually makes you happy, listen to our previous episode. Now, for our interview with Dana. Today, we have another exciting guest on the show, Dana Cavalia. Dana is a high-level performance coach, speaker, and author. He coaches pro athletes, entrepreneurs, and business executives on lifestyle strategies to improve daily performance and outcomes. He's the former director of performance for the New York Yankees, whom he led to a World Series championship in 2009. His first book, Habits of a Champion, he shares the secrets to becoming a champion. Dana, welcome to the Science of Success. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very excited to have you on the show today and, and to dig into these topics. You know, being a champion and, and championship high level peak performance is a topic that's been one of my own really passion projects and things that I've spent a ton of time and energy researching and studying. And so I can't wait to dig in. And even the the subtitle of the book really caught my eye, which is this idea that I'd like to kind of start the conversation with today off of is that nobody becomes a champion by accident. What does that mean? Yeah. So listen, in all my years of working with professional athletes, I realized that the great ones, there's something special about them and it's not just their talent. And when you really start to, to pull things back and you really start to take a deep dive, you start to see like, what are these habits and, and what makes them different than everybody else is that they have an ability to be extremely consistent, extremely disciplined, and they're not chasing the shiny object. And before we even get to that point, I realized that nobody becomes a champion by accident. You can't be a default 
champion. You know, they had a vision for themselves. They had talent. They combined that with the work. And when you put all of that together and you stay consistent in your daily process, the end result can be championship performances. So becoming a champion, it's, it, it takes a lot of work as, as we know, but there are some key steps to, to getting yourself there. And one of the keys is, you know, in working with guys like, you know, Mariano Rivera is that you realize that he wasn't trying to be something that he wasn't. And that gave him a lot of confidence from within. So I say he was a very intentional champion. And that took daily discipline, daily process, and through consistency, he was able to achieve, you know, what what he's achieved. So uh, just as an example. So what are some of those steps, some of those commonalities that you see of intentional champions? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. You know, I know we're in a culture right now of, you know, biohacking and 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 looking for all of these. I still call them and consider them, you know, somewhat of quick fixes. Now, some of them work really well, but what I found was what makes the guys champions and the steps that they take, it goes back to the just the simple fundamentals and the basics. So before we talk about biohacking our system and and really introducing some of those modalities and and action steps, we got to get the body and we got to get the mind right. We got to get it aligned. And for me, as as an on-field coach, what I always started with was a conversation and understanding where the mindset was of that particular player as an individual. Because every team is made up of individuals. We have to figure out what's going on in between those ears, that six inches of each of those players. So for me, the first step of becoming or moving somebody towards champion status is really understanding what their thoughts are. What are their patterns? What is going through their head when they may not be aware of what they're even thinking? And that for me has always been step one. And from that point, then we start to dissect and understand, hey, what are you doing throughout the day? What are your daily habits? Where are you putting your time? Where are you spending your time that's giving you a return on your time? And where are you wasting your time? So we start to go through this process almost of, uh, you know, dissection to understand what's going on. And then from that point, we start to move through this process of, of understanding and then moving into specifics where we can start to say, hey, what's the return we're getting on this action? What's the return we're getting on that action? And which is greater. And that's how we actually start to formulate routines for our players. And That is the ultimate goal because your daily actions, your daily habits, and your daily routines are what move you through your process of success. And if you look at most successful people that don't just have success financially, but when you break down each part of their life, you know, their relationships, their overall health and wellness and fitness status, and what they do in their career, you know, both for profit and in terms of charity. That is what ultimate success is. How are we firing in all those buckets and making it work? And then we have a sense of groundedness that makes us feel secure within ourselves. And, and, and that's how the process of moving towards champion, champion status and success works. It's very individualized. I always like to say, tell people there are really no quick fixes. I know that's not good for you know, marketing purposes, but it, it takes time to sometimes unwind the psychology habits and patterns that have been developed and conditioned for some and most their entire life. You know, I think that's probably one of the most important themes and and one of the things that I see again and again when studying peak performers across any field or any discipline. It's it's this notion that there's no such thing as a quick fix or a hack or a shortcut. Really championship performance at the deepest level is about fundamentally mastering the basics. Exactly. And in addition to, I also find it also comes down to, again, really knowing yourself, knowing what makes you tick and what, and and also knowing the things that, that take you off course. What are your, I call them trip wires. What are your trip wires? What are the things that you keep gravitating towards that are not positively affecting your overall directionality and where you want to go. Because sometimes as much as we want to hack, we're also being hijacked 
And we have to realize that. So we need to find out what's kind of hijacking our performance and what traps and tripwires are we falling into and tripping over in the process. So, and ultimately, you know, when you meet a lot of the guys that, that have 10 plus years careers, especially in pro sports, there's also a level of groundedness and security that you feel when they're around and they really get you to number one, take that breath and feel really comfortable around them because they're so secure in themselves. They're not letting the externals affect their internal world. They're not externally driven and motivated. Everything comes from within and therefore they don't let external things and situations and words and actions affect their internal environment. Let's come back, and I, I want to dig into a couple of the things you've talked about so far. I want to start with this idea, which you've already started expanding on, but this notion of the mindset of a champion. Tell me a little bit more about, in your work with people who are literally world champions, what have you seen in terms of what is their mindset, and, and also how do they create and cultivate that mindset? Yeah, so I'll give you two great examples and, and one is very fitting for when we're recording this in, in the great Mariano Rivera, number 42, closer for the New York Yankees and, and recent Hall of Fame inductee. And, you know, Mariano came on the scene back in 1995 in the New York area for the Yankees. You know, he was a skinny kid from Panama, you know, takes the mound, you know, opens people's eyes. In 1996, he really makes a name for himself when the Yankees win the championship and he locks it down in the seventh and eighth inning each night. And I remember I was a kid in high school at that time and I was watching him play. And I just remember the elegance, the grace, and most importantly, the calm that this man had. And at the time he was maybe only 27, 28 years old. You know, I said, I wonder how he does it. Because as a kid, I, I was somebody that was at that point still trying to figure out who I am, what I do, and, and what I'm all about. I probably had a lot of self-doubt at the time as well. And I saw this guy pitch, and it was something that I that I, I froze in my mind, that, that image. So anyway, fast forward really about 15 years, and I'm actually in Mariano's house in Westchester, New York. I'm in his basement, and we're just talking. I'm working on him. I'm stretching him. And I say, Mo, you know what? After all these years, I have a question that I need to ask you. It's been pending since 1995. And he looks at me and he says, what's that, buddy? And I said, you know, how do you do it? Like, how do you do it? And he looks at me and he says, do what? And I said, how do you get it done in the big situations? You know, the situations when most people would melt or, you know, they have 50,000 eyes on them, plus everyone watching from home. And, and you go out there in the thick of it and just get it done. And he smirks and he says to me, he says, you know, buddy, I do three things. Number one, I slow everything down. He goes, number two, I quiet the noise. And number three, I throw one pitch at a time. So he never again let the situations and things that were going on around him affect his internal world. So for him, it was peace and quiet with conviction and determination. And it wasn't, oh man, this crowd, the situation, he wasn't focused on any of that. So he was actually able to see and visualize his success in that moment. And then I said, okay, that's great for the regular season, but what about the big games? You know, the World Series, game on the line, everything matters. And this was kind of a, a really defining moment, you know, in my own personal growth and personal psychological switch. And he said, buddy, he goes, there are no big situations. Every situation and every moment is the same. We decide what we give life to. We decide what is a big moment. He goes, but everything is the same. And I said, wow, that was really profound because how many things in life do we get worked up about? And if you think about it, you're getting worked up about it because you're putting your attention to it. You're putting your focus to it. And you're allowing that moment to become bigger than you. And that's the fastest way to fail, as opposed to keeping everything calm and, and focusing and visualizing yourself having success without the elevation of heart rate, without the elevation of, you know, respiratory rate. And that's what he was able to do better than everybody else. And when you talk about the ice in the veins and performing under pressure, number one, he was a master. But number two, he taught us how he does it. And he doesn't focus on the moment. 
he doesn't focus on the magnitude and the size of the moment because in his mind it doesn't exist as anything more than just another moment. So that that was one one example. And the other in terms of psychological state was a guy by the, by the name of Derek Jeter, who most people know. And, you know, in baseball, and, and the reason I love baseball and I love relating baseball to business and life is because baseball is a sport that is absolutely built around failure. And if you allow that failure to take you down, it will. And, you know, there was a point during the season where Derek Jeter was about 0 for 30, 0 for 31. He hadn't gotten a hit in 31 at bats. And what happens? He doesn't get a hit. And the media in New York wants to know what's going on. Are you worried about your career? You're getting older. Could this be the end? And he answers back and he says, you know, I haven't gotten a hit in 31 at bats. That means I'm that much closer to getting a hit. Because he knew he couldn't go 0 for 60, 0 for 70. So he knew that the deeper he went into the slump, actually, the closer he was getting to a hit. And I found that these guys have an ability to do what I call reframe. They reframe negative moments or perceive negative moments to be positive. And you could do that in any line of work. You know, it's getting caught up in the ups and downs of the stock market, you know, and, and allowing that volatility to create volatility within a deal that doesn't go through, you know, that could train wreck a lot of people if they've been banking on it. So the ability to reframe, the ability to not create a bigger situation than the situation that's in front of you, all of that is, is super, super important when it comes to mindset. And for me, it's not about the hacks. It's always about how can you create more security and more grounding within yourself. And you realize very quickly that most of that is perspective driven. It's not about, you know, if you take this vitamin, you'll be able to do this more or whatever. It's, it's really about training your mind to see things in a certain way. And, and you switch the tracks very quickly. If you find yourself going negative and down and pessimistic, boom. As if a railroad track would switch tracks, you switch your tracks the other way. But you have to have enough self-awareness to realize that your, your tracks are taking you down a bad road and a negative path to some negative patterns. So That's such a cornerstone of any personal development is having self-awareness. And without self-awareness, you really can't take the steps necessary to correct any challenges or problems that you're facing or even know that they're there. It, exactly. And, and I find today, like we, you know, it, it sounds very cliche and you hear it over and over again. We're such, we're in the information era and there's, there's information everywhere and there's always been information and it's always been accessible to those that want to access it. But today, what I find we don't do enough of is really investing in ourselves, not by seeking other people's information, but really seeking the information that we already have within ourselves and within our internal computer. And Hey, when I do this, how do I feel? You know, again, I coach a lot of executive leaders, Wall Street guys and athletes. And the first thing I try to teach them is to listen to themselves, like hear what you're actually telling yourself in the moments when you're not, you know, fully conscious, maybe of what you're telling yourself, like try to hit pause throughout the day. You know, now we're in that scrolling culture, which is different than the past. You know, we scroll, we scroll, we go on Instagram, we go on social feeds and I tell people, I say, listen, let me ask you something. What's the last five things that you saw? Please describe it to me in detail. Describe the last five things you saw while you were scrolling. And you'll be amazed that most people can't describe what they saw in detail because the input of pictorial imagery that they're taking in, their brain can't process it at that speed. They're taking in so much stimuli that they can't process it fast enough. So the brain doesn't remember what you're actually seeing. So... We, as, as a culture, again, especially in that 25 to 35 age bracket, we're wasting a lot of our precious energy and time and, and time that we could be focusing on ourselves in a healthy way to ground ourselves by looking at what others are doing. And that's the fastest way to sabotage. That's the fastest way to, based on what I said about Mo Mariano, is you're focused on externals, other people. And that means you're taking away from yourself, your own journey, your own ride, and really taking the time to understand what's happening from within yourself. You know, the other piece of that is 
you said we're wasting so much time, we're wasting so much energy on these things like social media and focusing on other people. I think the other piece that underscores this is that we're also wasting so much focus and attention that could be much better spent. Right, because we only we only have so much of it, and you know I'm sure a lot of the listeners are probably like me in that, you know, the more time I spend on my phone and the more time I spend, you know, on my devices and technology, it exhausts me. Like I feel a level of mental fog and fatigue, and I know that that's just coming from too many inputs. You know, it's about really the the more you can simplify things, and that's again something else that I learned from these champion performers is that they prefer a very simple life. It wasn't about how can I do more? It was about how can I do less and get more out of less because I'm doing less. I can give better effort. I can give more attention. And that less is actually what moves my needle. So, so many of us, we may be doing a hundred percent of our, of our work, but there's really only 25% of that total that moves the needle for you. It's your job to find out what that 25% is. And you could with 25, 100% effort on the 25% can move your needle a lot further and a lot faster than if you're just taking in so much and trying to do everything. And that was another very important thing that I saw, efficiency and knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, and most importantly, doubling down on your strengths and delegating your weaknesses as best you can. Another great point, and I think it bears repeating that championship performance is not about doing more things. It's about doing fewer things. It's about doing less. And it's about using things like the 80-20 principle to figure out the really important things to focus your time on and create leverage so that you can get the maximum amount of effort for the few core things that you're focused on. It, exactly. And it depends to where you're at, obviously, in your business journey and in your overall career. I mean, as much as, you know, if you're in startup mode, it's very hard to delegate everything. But when you're in startup mode, you should be learning, hey, what are the things that I'm awesome at where I'm a rock star? And what are the things I'm really struggling with? And again, that what you're really struggling with is probably where your first hires should come from. But by you trying to put all your attention there and it's taking away from your greatness, and that's what's going to be what drives you forward in all that you do. And the typical sports analogy, you know, when I was growing up was about be the first one there and the last one to leave. That that was something that was really important for a lot of coaches and a lot of programs and even a lot of employment settings. And when I got to the Yankees, what I saw was Derek Jeter, A-Rod, Jorge Posada, Mariano Rivera, Andy Pettit. First, again, these guys are probably going to be, you know, first ballot Hall of Famers. And what I saw was they were the last ones there and the first ones to leave. But when they got there, they executed a very tight, organized, and time-sequenced process to get things done. And they hit the ground running. Boom. It was – you could buy – if you, if you looked at your clock at 6.45, you knew where Derek Jeter was. I mean, these guys took it to the point where they ate the same things before every game. That was the level of consistency that they showed and applied. So it, it was a different process. It doesn't You don't have to be the first one there and the last one to leave. Like they said, what am I producing and what am I getting done while I'm here instead of just being here? That gets into something you touched on earlier that I wanted to follow back up on, this idea of daily discipline of consistency and and dissecting the daily habits of these world performers. I, I'd love to dig into a little bit more around what you saw and what you've learned about how to craft and create these really effective daily disciplines and daily rituals. Yeah. So I always say no two people should or can have the same routine. The results of two people doing the same routine will ultimately be very different. So there's a lot of talk today about morning routines and routine, routine, routine. And what I see is a lot of people copying the routines of other people. You know, oh, this is what a guy like Steve Jobs did. This is what so-and-so does. But you have to realize that you're not so-and-so, you're you. And what works for one doesn't always work for the other. And it's because we are all different. You know, cellularly, we're different. We all have different mileage. We're all at different age ranges. So we need to address that. So when I looked at a player that was, 
you know, 18 years old and a player that was 40, the plan is very different, but it's not just because of their age that plays into it, but it's also because of their psychology. It's also because of some other factors that, that may exist like, you know, pain patterns, injury history. You know, if somebody's a, a natural evening person or night person telling them they need to get up at five o'clock in the morning is not going to get the best out of them. Now you look at the people that are in fields like music. A lot of great artists are, are up at two, three in the morning. Their, their greatest thoughts and their greatest creativity comes out at that time. My father-in-law is a Oscar winning makeup artist up all night. And that's when his greatness comes out. So if I tell him, Hey, you need to be up at five in the morning and you need to you know, make sure you have your green juice. You need to foam roll. You need to do all this stuff. He's going to look at me like I'm crazy because that's not how his greatness shows and expresses himself. So when it comes to putting together routines, like I said in the beginning, it's very important to know the person, know yourself, know your tendencies. Because I'm a person that does best between 4 a.m. and 10 a.m which would sound crazy. Hey, by 10 a.m., you've already, you know, your your best hours are behind you. I said, yeah, because I love the quiet, the focus. I'm introverted. And I just love that peace in the morning. You find me at nine o'clock, 8.30, eight o'clock, I'm all ready to pass out on the couch where other people are just hitting stride at that time. So my morning, my routine should be built around the morning. Somebody else should be built around the nighttime if that's their normal, you know, cadence. So that's where it all starts. I, I, you're going to see, I always take the question back to who, you, who are you as an individual? And that's what my whole practice is built on. You know, I would say I was an asset manager with the team. I watched over $300 million in human capital and none of those two humans acted the same. So I had to understand how they responded to everything, you know, and then create the plan based on their individuality. Now, if I tell you, hey, by the way, they've done research and they say kale and spinach are so good for you. It'll change your life. It'll prevent cancer. It'll do all these things. And you say, hey, whenever I eat that, I get gastrointestinal distress. But still, the research says it prevents this, it prevents that. And over that's not a good suggestion for you because it's creating, although in society, it may create a positive overall, and the research says the reality is for you, those may not be good choices. And that's just a, a simple example. But we got to under start to understand what works for us. How do we test things and start to build a routine around, hey, I tested this on myself and I got a great result. I tested that on myself and I got a bad result. Even though, you know, the mass marketing says this is really good, it may not be really good for you. And that is what it's all about, helping people to create, develop and understand their own personal routines that they can own. If I make it for you and you make it for you, it's now yours. So what's going to happen as a result of that? Your compliance to it, your results when you execute with consistency on that routine are going to be that much better. You know? So that's really what what I find to be really important. You know, I was at my cousin's house last week and telling me, hey, you have to put butter in your coffee and you have to put all these things in your coffee. And I said, listen, that's not for everybody. If you have a lactose issue, if you have some other issues, that doesn't work. But for some, it may work great. So that's why you got to always go back to the individual. And I bring up that $300 million number because we had to make sure that these guys performed at the highest level. And that started by dissecting them as individuals and understanding what makes them tick and what makes them also rebel even against themselves. So for somebody who's listening, how would you recommend that they start to take those first steps towards crafting a daily routine that is aligned and and sort of tailored to helping them personally perform at their peak? Yeah, so I I always lead with health. So I say, all right, let's we're going to lead with health and we can kind of wrap our our fitness with that. Health and fitness we'll we'll put that together. And this is going to sound so simple, but I always start with your overall hydration status. What is your hydration status? So people say, this is where we start. How much water am I drinking? So I tell, I say, listen, half your body weight in ounces a day of water. We're going to start there. Are you doing that? Yes or no? And most people will tell you no. 
They are drinking half a gallon of coffee, perhaps, but they're not drinking enough water. And when you add more water to your system, you create efficiency in your system from a contractile standpoint of muscle to a hydration standpoint of all of your tissue. And it'll also help to regulate your overall digestive tract. So that's where I start. And I, I am different in, in other, than other people because I don't hit them with a lot. So for example, I'm working with an executive in San Diego. And, and what we're working on now is, again, this guy was dehydrated most of the time. And when you're dehydrated, it'll also affect your, your overall energy and vitality. So half your body weight ounces per day. We start there. Are you doing that? Yes or no. And then I, I guide them through that. We do that for a week. We do that for two weeks. And then we start to introduce other aspects. So most people today, they sit for a majority of the day. So step two is now we start to address more of the physical. So I get them doing a daily foam rolling routine, a daily stretching routine. And I put that right when they get up. So if they get up at 10 a.m. or if they get up at 5 a.m., it doesn't matter. But we're going to address your tissue. And there's two reasons. So we're first hydrating the tissue with water. And then what we're doing with the foam rolling is we're, we're pressing. We're getting the tissue to break up any knots or trigger points or what I call tension points. Because the higher the stress, the type A, the more type A the person, the more of a chaser and hardcore, hard charger they are, the body harbors stress within its tissues. So that makes you more susceptible to aches, pains, and injury. So we hydrate the tissue, then we relax the tissue, and then from there, we stretch the tissue. So that's like the first three steps of me building out a morning a, a routine for a person. They're very easy checkpoints, and that routine itself can take you maybe 10 minutes. And that's how we start them on, on their day. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, that's not working for me, then we start to create alternatives to that. Some people don't like foam rolling, so we use hot baths instead. And, and that's kind of how we start that, that tweaking. But the best way to know what works for you is ask yourself, when I do this, do I feel better or do I feel worse or do I feel the same? And your answer should be, hey, you know what? It may not feel great while I'm doing it, but when I'm done, I feel great. And that's how we start building it out. You know, it's interesting starting these daily routines, even for performers beyond the athletic space. As somebody who comes out of the fitness world, why do you think it's so important to begin with a physical component to these daily routines or focusing on the body first? I break it down really simply. Hey, after you work out and after you exercise, do you feel better or worse psychologically? And I don't know many people that finish their workout and don't feel great about themselves. So I like to start my day feeling great about my day. I like to start my day feeling great about myself. So although I train athletes on their mindset, I change their mindset by first starting with physical modification. Because I believe if you activate the body physically, you'll create a different mental state and a different mental feeling. And, you know, I, I find a lot of people today, they don't feel good about themselves. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, again, I, I can say this because I've, I've coached a lot of people through the years. And ultimately, there's people are, there's a lot of down and out people and they lost their way. They lost their will. And I've always found that it's my job to help get them back on track. And I say, listen, we're going to get you in shape, but we're not going to do it with detoxes and cleanses and 10 day, you know, this and 10 day that, you know, we'll put you on the Brussels sprout diet. We're going to get you to execute this process one step at a time. And when we look back, over three months, nothing is going to feel like it was that hard because we're going to focus on one thing at a time. And then we're going to focus on the next thing. And then we're going to focus on the next. And when we look back, we've changed a lot of things about how we live and how we feel and then how we think. So it's all of that together, but we do it one step at a time. And that's why, even you know, for me, I'm not for everybody because most people don't have the patience. But I did an experiment with one of my clients that wanted to go fast. And I said, you want to go fast? Let's go fast. And what happened was he his train derailed because he wanted me to hit him with, you know, the diet, the training, the this all at the same time. And I, I said, let's do it. And now he lost his mojo and he feels like, man, I don't know where to begin. And I said, that's why we start one thing at a time. 
it was meant to teach a lesson. It's about what you do over a year, what you do over two years, and can you be consistent in that evolution and development of yourself? That's how you become a champion. And that comes back to what we were talking about earlier, this idea of focusing on fewer things, mastering really simple things. And then once you've mastered that, that really simple activity, then you start to add on something else and master that. And then you start to add on something else. Exactly. And, and also part two is, you know, I I ask a lot of people, Hey, what is your vision for yourself? What are you trying to build? What are you trying to create? What does it look like? And you'll be amazed after you ask that question, how many people can't answer that question, but they're working their butts off every day. They're working their butts off. They're showing up. They're giving it hundred percent effort and they can't even define what it is they're trying to build for themselves. That's crazy to me. So think about it. How could you be possibly feeling fulfilled and happy and excited if you haven't defined exactly what you're trying to build? Because if, what are you doing every day? Is your process taking you closer to, what is it taking you closer to? You haven't defined where you actually even want to go. It's like saying, hey, I want to go on a vacation and travel and you haven't picked a destination, but you're at the airport jumping on flight after flight after flight and you end up, you know, all these different places, but you actually wanted to go somewhere else. So that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Do you have a great idea for a business or a passion that you want to take to the next level? If so, have you ever wondered what's holding you back? If the thought of having to handle tedious administrative tasks seems overwhelming or stopping you from taking action, our sponsor, HoneyBook, is here to help you get your plans off the ground. HoneyBook is an online business management tool that lets you control everything from client communication to booking, contracts, and invoices all in one place. If you're looking to start a business or even if you already own a small business, HoneyBook can help you stay organized with custom templates and automation tools. Over 75,000 photographers, designers, event professionals, and other entrepreneurs have saved hundreds to thousands of hours every year by using HoneyBook. So right now, HoneyBook is offering our listeners 50% off of your first year with the promo code SUCCESS. Payment is flexible, and this promotion applies whether you pay monthly or annually. Go to HoneyBook.com and use the promo code SUCCESS for 50% off of your first year. Get paid faster and work smarter with HoneyBook.com. Promo code SUCCESS. So I want to come back to... Actually, before we do that, one of the other things that you've touched on, but I think it, it... I want to dig into it a little bit more is something that sounds cliche. You hear it all the time, but how important is consistency to world-class performance? It's everything. And I always say the fastest way to disrupt a high performer is disrupt their routine. And by disrupting their routine, you've automatically disrupted their ability to be consistent because They don't go and say, I want to be consistent. That's not how it works. It's within them. That consistency is a part of their being. And a guy like Derek Jeter, I'll use it as an example again. You know, when we would have rain delays, he would would be the only time you would see distress on his face. and, And he'd almost be panicking. He'd literally be watching the weather and tracking, you know, jet stream movement from the Midwest to the New York area to see when the rain would hit and when there may be what we would call a window to where we can get a game because he wanted to know he had to start his pregame routine at the same time before the first pitch every single day. So that, that is something that altered routines, but, but the consistency factor, it's everything, but you can't be consistent at everything. So again, circling back to, you know, keeping it simple, keeping it small and keeping it very focused. If you have too many things, you can't focus on anything, and therefore your chances for consistency go way down. And this is another example that I use. If I told you, listen, you got to do 10 push-ups and and 10 jumping jacks every single day for the next three months, you would be amazed at how many people couldn't do that. They can't do it. The average person cannot commit to doing the same thing every single day for a 90-day period. Can't do it. And 
that shows you that even in a very with 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 even the smallest of tasks, they need to actually start to train themselves to be consistent again in the moment and say, listen, I'm going to be, I have this to do. Let me do that. And I need to get that done before I can move to the next thing. And that's why I'm very focused on the law of one, do one thing at a time, do it well, achieve it, and then move on because that'll improve your overall consistency in what you do. So tell me more about the law of one and and for, for listeners, how do we build consistency for somebody who, it is in a, in, I feel like in our world today, it's so easy to get distracted, disrupted. Your attention gets sucked away by Instagram or your phone or all these notifications. How does somebody who's in this state of distraction start to create consistency in their life? Yeah. So like I said before, the first part is to identify. You got to identify what is interrupting your ability to be consistent. Ultimately, it's you, but there are things that we allow ourselves and choices that we make and we allow ourselves to get involved with these energy suckers. And, you know, for me personally, I had to take apps off my phone. I had to take Twitter. I had to take Instagram. I had to take Facebook. I had to take LinkedIn all off of my phone. So I can only go on them. I mean, I can go on them through my browser, but I don't only through a a desktop because I realized, Hey, you have all these things that you want to accomplish today. What is inhibiting you from accomplishing those things? And it was the the scrolling and that scroll would, you know, take me off path. It would take me off center and take me off my own mission, vision and goal. So I said, if I can stop that, I'll start to create more efficiency just by eliminating elimination. And that's what I find. There's, there's, you know, things like apps. There's also in, in the corporate world, you know, meetings are so ineffective so many different oftentimes you know we're meeting to meet it gets to that point and that becomes a drain and takes away from the consistency of your work and the consistency of your flow the other thing is working too long and working too many hours so i believe that you get your bolt your best output and your best production and working in 90 minute windows so you work an hour and a half then you take a break relax let your mind unwind you know take a break for 30 minutes and then go back in. And if you could do four micro cycles of an hour and a half, you're actually getting six hours of focused work done and you're getting two hours of total rest in between when you add up the 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and 30 minutes. So that's why, again, taking it back to self, where did you get off track? And those things that are taking you off track are ultimately hijacking your ability to stay focused, which is ultimately taking away from your ability to stay consistent. So Find where you're wasting time, find where you're focused on things that are, you know, not serving you. Like I I had a a guy that works on Wall Street that was spending way too much time on his strategy and not enough time on executing what moves his needle. So for him, it was phone calls, getting in touch with banks, getting in touch with other PE guys. And he was trying to come up with his plan. And I said, forget the plan. Get to work, make the phone calls. And in one week, he had more action in one week than he had had in almost 52 weeks all of last year because he kept drawing circles and lines and connecting this. And he was over planning, again, taking away from action, which ultimately hijacks his results and his overall consistency. So that's, that's why it always returns to self and understanding your negative habits so then you could eventually create those positive ones that leads you to, again, more of a champion performance. You bring up another really good point, which is, and, and this is a theme I've seen in my own study of, of world champion performers, is this importance of rest and recovery and having that downtime and, and integrating that into the routine as a part of the ritual of, of being a champion. Yeah. So there's two things that I do with that. I always tell people, listen, you got to have a transition between work and home. For some that's taking a shower, for some that's a workout and a shower, for some it's, you know, hitting a steam room. Some it's, it's, it's getting home and, and changing out of work clothes into more relaxed wear. For some like A-Rod, for example, he was a guy that he'd actually stage his home for nighttime 
So at about six o'clock, the lights would dim, music would go on Sonos that was more calming and chill, candles were lit. And, you know, people don't see athletes in this manner, but it's, they get it because they understand they're so in tune and in touch with their body that they understand how environments make them feel good or make them feel bad. They understand how certain actions make them feel good or make them feel bad. And ultimately, when you put all that together, you're able to find what works for you. But as it relates to recovery, what I find is a non-negotiable is putting in a transition between work and home just to kind of calm yourself, slow yourself down. For some, like I said, it could be a hot bath, steam, sauna. It could be a workout. It could be laying on the floor, literally, for five, 10 minutes and not, not meditating, but just being unplugged. And that is so important. I have, I have one guy that I work with that he's a drummer. And after work, he runs his company during the day. He takes 15, 20 minutes and plays the drums and jams out. And that's his transition to where he could then go be with his family. So recovery comes in so many different forms. Many things today, like I said, if you're a meditator, if you see other people not meditating, you feel as if, you know, they're missing out, but not everybody is ready for full throttle meditation. For some, a walk after work is meditative. For some, a walk in the woods is meditative. For some, sitting outside and just listening to nature is meditative. So recovery comes in many different forms. Many of our players after a game, you know, I set them up with bath salts in their hotel room and they would literally take a hot bath and chill out. And I call it burning their top layer off in a warm, hot bath, more of a hot bath and then shower, nice, cool shower. And it, and it brings their whole system down. It downshifts their whole system. That's a form of recovery. But I do think there, there needs to be a place for recovery every single day. I want to come back to something you talked about earlier that I, I want to figure out how we can apply to our lives, which is this idea of reframing things. And, and when you talk about the mindset of a champion and, and dealing with high stress, difficult situations, how do we concretely think about reframing those negative moments into positive moments? Yeah. So again, I go back to this. You got to know what's causing that negative thought process, right? And oftentimes you're, you'll probably find you're shortchanging yourself in some way, somewhere. If you're working too much and you're not recovering and you're not spending time with family and doing some recreational things, that builds negativity over time because you're so off balance. So first, again, it's understanding, you know, is my day set up to win? You got to ask that for, you know, only you'll know the answer for that. Or am I too much, you know, on one side of the field and not spending enough time on the other? So that that's that's the start of it. But the other thing is really just understanding your thoughts. And, and again, almost hearing yourself think. You know, personally, I, I know that with a lack of sleep, I can get negative pretty quick, especially the next day. So that's why sleep helps keep me positive. And I need less reframes. But again, after every phone call, you know, if you're if you're in business and, and you have a call that doesn't go well, you got to take a minute and after that call, kind of diffuse the call. And at that point, you may you tell yourself, hey, although that may have been a negative result, boom, now I switch my tracks and I'm I'm moving past it. And I'll give you just an example of you know baseball players. But if you watch a guy like Derek Cheater through the years. You know, if, if he struck out or he got out in a big situation, he'd come into the dugout. He'd take a towel and it looked like his wife in his face. But he took that moment and screamed, dropping an F-bomb into the towel. And at that point, he wiped his face again and the moment was clear. So that was his tactic, if you will, to reframe. It wasn't a conscious thought of, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch my thoughts. He let it out. And then at that point, he moved past it. So you got to find what what works for you. And, and we're all wired, you know, very differently. But And there's, again, certain moments that cause us to be more negative and certain moments that that elicit positive. But what I found is if we can work to create almost a, a flat line where our mood stays very, very consistent because we've conditioned ourselves to think more on the positive side, that doesn't mean we have to get overly excited and jubilant. It just means, hey, you know what? My perspective on life, 
is is more on the on the positive side because I'm choosing that. I have an analogy I use. I call it staying above the horizon line. So if 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 there's a, you look out, you see a horizon line, below the line is negative, above the line is positive. So you can say, hey, above the line on a sunny day, it's positive, it's bright, and it's happy. You got to catch yourself falling below that horizon line. When you're there, realize it, and all you got to do is say, get above the line, move above the horizon line. So that's a, a verbal cue to do it. So there's different tools, and, and every person responds differently. Some people yelling, getting it out. I say, let the demons out. I used to have a CEO of a private aviation company come into my training facility. And in the mornings, he'd be on the treadmill and he'd literally scream at the top of his lungs. And I would say, get it out, get it out, get it out. And that for him was a way of getting almost like an emotional release. And at, after that, he was calmed down. And it was amazing. So everybody's a little bit different. And, you know, obviously people observing that would think he's borderline clinical, but, you know, it, there's different tools and different tricks, you know, for everybody. So for somebody who's listening to this interview that, that wants to start concretely implementing some of the things we've talked about, what would be one action item that you would give them as a first step to really begin applying some of these ideas? Well, the first step is asking yourself if you're actually ready to take action and commit to what it is that you say that you want. Because that, that's, that's the key. I mean, you ask somebody, hey, do you want to be rich? Nine out of 10 people, 10 out of 10 people will say yes. Are you willing to do the work? <laughs> and nine out of 10 people will probably say yes. And then when you actually describe the, the work that goes into it, you may be down to 20%. So it's kind of the same with this. You know, you got to ask yourself if you're actually ready to take action. And when your pain is great enough, you take action. But for, for me, it starts with that question. And at that point, like I said before, you know, activate your physical self. You know, before you get into the diets and all that, like just hit your basics. Am I drinking enough water, number one? Are my thoughts more positive and negative? And can I catch myself in the negative moment? and move myself above that horizon line start there hydration mindset and then like i said you can start to add in the morning stretching and flexibility and move towards a transition in the afternoon start there worry about the monday wednesday friday the tuesday thursday or the monday through friday workout worry about that after but show consistency in the water show consistency in your ability to catch yourself in the in your thought process and then lastly, you know, get your daily stretching in because stretching is a great intro point, foam rolling and stretching to get somebody to activity and get them to take the next step is more exercise. So I basically walk them to the end of the diving board with the hydration, the mindset shifting and, you know, the daily foam rolling and stretching. And then the next thing they say is, Hey, I've been really good at that. What's next? And now you're at the end of the diving board and I get you to jump. And on the other, you know, once you jump off the board, then we get into a formal training program in terms of your exercise. And then we move you into some dietary reform and, and move you through the process from there. So, but we got to walk you to the end of the diving board. You have to choose to get on the board, walk to the end, and then you make the decision if and when you're ready to jump. And that's how it works. And where can listeners find you and your work online? Yeah, so danacavalia.com. I write a daily blog, you know, with ha you know some of these habits that we talked about and I have a YouTube channel. It's all accessible through there. And the book is on the, on the site and it's also on Amazon. Well, Dana, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing all this wisdom, some really great insights into what it truly takes to perform at a world-class level. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T -T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you and I read and respond to every single listener email.
I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. Success.